solves problems for innovators at tech startups, established media companies, and big brands. When he's not writing Rails and Node.js, he spends time riding his bike, enjoying bad comedies, and chasing around his adorable baby girl. Please put your hands together for Derek Watson. It's not like it's not just more work 
for one team is typically broken out into multiple projects. So like the CLS is one project, the API is yet another project. Those are often like tightly coupled. Uh, and so is the website. But then if you do a separate mobile site, like it's like another guy doing that one. The iPhone app is like not only another guy, but maybe another agency doing that because it's like so different and so much extra work. iPad app, often the same as the iPhone app, but then Android, you need another team, it's completely different. Um, tech stack and so on. You guys get the picture. It's like a lot of pieces go into the same solution. Um, so for Sobeys, what launched today is like we did a CMS, an API that was in Rails, uh, and then we had a website. That's really all like the same project. Uh, it's MS2, right? So we did Responsive Web, which um, Responsive Web, I gotta say, like nothing bad to say about it. It's pretty much the way to go today, um, but it's very, very. I guess the best word is expensive, like in terms of time and testing and how much effort goes in. Uh, it's also expensive to execute because the product that you ship to the to the mobile client is very heavy. It's got it's got everything that the desktop could want, that the tablet could want, and that the mobile phone could want. So it's expensive in all senses of the word. Um, and then in addition, even though we did a killer job on responsive web, and I, I'm like, I didn't do it personally, but I was a big part of the project, and I'm super proud of what we have there. Um, we also needed to do an iPhone app that sort of duplicates and extends on the mobile work we have here, and then also an Android app. So you start to see like the, the breadth of uh, projects that goes into a solution like this. Uh, never have I seen it more intense than uh, the bit of work that we did with the Globe and Mail, um, those guys have an impressive mandate to deliver their content to every living Canadian. They don't want anyone not reading the Globe and Mail because it's not in their favorite package, it's not on their platform. So they have the traditional CMS and API, they have a website, they have a separate mobile site, these two things are connected. And they build an iPhone app, and they build an iPad app, and an Android app, and a Windows 7 phone app, and we built the Windows 8 desktop app, and they're in BlackBerry app world. And like, if like Toaster app needs to come out tomorrow, like they'll build that too. Like they have like an all in the same <laughs> platform. But you can imagine, especially, um, you know, like the publishing industry, ain't what it used to be. <laughs> it's very expensive to do this, and I'm sure they don't want to have to. But it's really, it really is the state of the art for a company like that. Um, and like almost two years ago now, this is like retrograde information. When I worked with CTV, they were struggling to get all, on all those platforms on the right. And I'm sure in the meantime, since I've been there, they've probably lit up a bunch of those gray items. But they were like so proud to get their iPad app in place. But they did a mix. They had like mobile sites all over the place and they were getting into responsive and like every which way they were trying to reform their content so that it was available to everybody. But that's a lot of apps. I don't know. Like I'm okay with it because I'm a developer and I like developing software. But Mugatu thinks that Blue Steel and La Tigra are all the same look, and he's not too happy about it. <laughs> so, like, I gotta agree with that. Like, there's a lot of duplication in these projects. Um, you know, like, like if you just look at the difference between uh, like uh, mobile web and Android native and iPhone native, like for example, the code is completely different. Like there's literally zero sh that you can share. You can't even share the consumer client for that HTTP API. It's like absolutely every little bit is rewritten. Um, and sometimes there's a great reason for that, right? Like sometimes you want those things to be different. Sometimes you want the iPad app to, to be completely different from the website. Um, but sometimes you don't. And in the cases, in the case of these three examples that I'm using, as far as I know, their mandate is to ship the same experience to all these platforms. So the end user experience, the goal is the same high bar for everything. So it's to me, like I love the web and I really believed in sort of the promise of that open technology where you write once and you deploy it everywhere. And it sort of runs, you know, with varying degrees of success, but it still runs. Um, and it's sort of, um, we sort of like gotten away from that for good reason, um, recently. So the web just isn't enough. Um, if you really, like like I said, like the Globe Mail example is like so crystal for me. Like they don't want anyone not reading the newspaper because it's not on the iPad and they just love reading news on the iPad so they'll move away from that news source. So there's a lot of business drivers that go into this, like what 
what Ugachi thinks is crazy is actually really sound because like these are like key things that like for brands like the ones I mentioned are really important. So number one is like being in the app store. This is just like a like a bedrock consumer behavior at this time where it's like the web just doesn't deliver that at the moment. Like you can't just go into um, like the app store and get something that's just a website or a mobile site or a responsive site. Like that just doesn't cut it. And furthermore, you can't necessarily launch that site from the desktop. I mean, with caveats, because I know like on iOS and maybe on Android, I'm not sure, but like there's ways to do it. And if you finagle the website the right way, then you can like have them launch the browser and go to the URL and then do a special trick and then put it on the desktop and then it launches. But it's just not the behavior that consumers are looking for. They're looking for you in a specific place. Uh, and then beyond that, um, there's like a native look and feel that's sort of like different on each of these platforms that users really um, internalize and I think personalize. And if you're an Android guy, you kind of want your apps to feel like Android. And if you're an iPhone guy, especially like with something as radical as iOS 7 coming out, you really want it to not look like a website and not look like an Android app. You want it to look like what you expect and to be catered to your platform. And then the last thing that I'm going to get to a little bit later is like speed and responsiveness. Um, the web, uh, what's the word? Uh, sucks. <laughs> I think sucks is the word for speed and responsiveness. It's like really heavyweight, slow loading, slow refreshing, and so on. I'm going to get to that a little bit as well. Um, but like it was, it's pretty good. But when you look at native apps, it's just not really as good at all. Um, and ultimately, this is the thing you don't want to do. Like, just putting this presentation together, I went like just typing in some random websites, and I found this one. I was like, okay, perfect. <laughs> this is an iPhone. Like, I know it's big on the screen right now, but <laughs> this is like 320 pixels wide, and like, there's just so much web here that you don't want. <laughs> and like, I guess um, I don't really I don't know what the language is. I guess like UI philosophy is the best thing that I can say. Where this is definitely a web UI, like, there's no there's no law saying that you have to put your logo up here, and you have to have a primary nav bar, and like, the user account is there, and then there's a carousel, and then like, a ton of promos, and then a footer, but like, pretty much every website works that way, and that's just like a real strong convention on the desktop web, but that's like, the last thing you want on your phone, because all this text is like, unclickable, I couldn't even click it at this size properly, let alone, like, in my hand. So this is sort of like a thing to avoid, and I think some of the reasons for going data first are, uh, there's a lot of reasons, but some of the reasons are simply to avoid the baggage that comes along with that design philosophy. But never fear, those lovers of the web. I think there's a comeback. I think that if the stars align just right, it all comes reliably, especially if your mobile browsers on the desktop. Clearly, you still have to deal with super legacy browsers and Internet Explorer and so on, but Relatively speaking, the device support is really good on mobile browsers. Uh, and furthermore, you've got some fast pieces. I mean, I dog the web for being slow, but you've got some good pieces these days. CSS3 and Canvas, hardware accelerated, which means like your CSS3 renderings and animations are accelerated by any sort of uh, hardware graphics that you have on device, which is fantastic. And like, I'm going to talk about Canvas in a minute, but you know, I don't know if you've seen like demos of like Quake in the browser, or the Unreal Engine, or Unity 3D. They're doing fantastic things like, like 3D video games at 60 frames a second. Like the performance of some of those tools is really not a problem. Um, so that's like a really good uh, piece that we have uh, in our tool, tool that we have in our toolbox going forward. Um, and then another good thing that I think a lot of people think is a bad thing is uh, JavaScript. I love it. Uh, and it's kind of like a weird language. Uh, they say that it's the language, it's the only language that developers think they don't need to learn to write. And so we have a lot, a lot of weird history with like a lot of junky code being written. Uh, but the one thing I will say about it is it's a simple enough language that um, it's really optimizable. And so what we have is this arms race between like the Mozilla guys and Apple and Google all sort of like one-upping each other on JavaScript VM performance. And in just like the last couple of years, it's become incredible and incredibly fast. And uh, you know, I think in my in, in my intro, I mentioned that I like Node.js, and it's like one of those things that's just fun to write in because it's so fast. And so, like going forward, I think like this stuff is all really good. Uh, but there's a few pieces that I think 
are sort of like subjective at this point, but like looking forward at the horizon might um, might change the game a little bit. And one of them that I've noticed like sort of like timely this week is like web app stores, which I didn't really think too much of recently, and maybe you didn't either because it's sort of like uh, I, don't, I didn't really get the point of it until just now, where to go to the Chrome web app store, I would go into my browser and then go to a URL and get the web app store, and I'm like, okay, great. I use Gmail every day. Let's get the Gmail app, and I would like search for it, and then Gmail comes up in the App Store, and I would click it, and it would launch a URL in my browser. I was like, okay, <laughs> that was fun, but isn't that just like a bookmark? So I'm not sure what the difference is between that and the App Store. Um, but like, actually, I mean, facetious, but truly there is a difference because what they're trying to get you to do is to package up your web app with uh, an application manifest and a bunch of local assets. Um, and like uh, declarations of permissions that you want to use for the device and so on, and you push all that metadata along with your app into the store, and ideally along with your assets and so on, um, into the store so that they can sort of take this idea to the next level um, and sort of be a little more on par with uh, the native experience of shipping, say, an Android app or an iPhone app. Um, and then, so where Chrome Web Store has their thing called Chrome Web App, Firefox slash Mozilla, I'm really not sure which brand they prefer anymore, has this other thing called Firefox Marketplace, and they have uh, their app container called Open Web App, which is the exact same thing. It's slightly different. It's just like an app manifest where you list all your stuff, and you push it into their store, and it's basically a bookmark. And so my question, back to like one of, my, one of those, like, those four important things that native apps do that you really can't get with the web, is like, can I just get that app store thing to install my desktop and I launch it and it doesn't come up in a browser. I sort of like tried to explore that and found, hilariously, because I was doing this presentation anyway, but um, it's sort of like coming of age where this is a launcher in OS X. Um, like I think this landed a couple days ago in Chromium, which is the basically the beta version of Google Chrome. So this is sort of two weeks out of being available for your Mac, where you have sort of like this second app launcher that does launches all your web apps. And like, ideally, I'm not sure if it will or not, but ideally, like when you launch Gmail, for example, on the second row on the left there, it'll come up without the browser, and it's just a window, like a Mac window. I really love that, because I use it all day, and I don't really need like the URL and all that stuff. Um, so like, they have their own custom app launcher, which is really nice, and same with uh, Firefox, Marketplace, uh, which is, this is a screenshot from that running on Android, and it's kind of the same thing where you have to launch an app to launch other apps. But I'm really hoping to sort of take this idea to the next level, uh, but it's just kind of maybe on the horizon and not there today. Um, so to answer the question, like, can you launch, can it install to your desktop? It's like, no, not yet, but maybe. But we're not really sure if that'll get there because I think it requires a lot of buy-in from like the fundamental OS vendor like Apple or Windows to allow that to happen. Um, and if you if you guys are like building web, I hope this next idea isn't too crazy and that you've heard about it and stuff because uh, it's I think super hot, super important as well. But client-side frameworks. So roughly the idea here. Let me just see what my next slide is. Yeah, yeah, so these are some examples. So I don't know if you've heard of like Ember, Backbone, Angular. Um, but basically the idea is instead of shipping HTML from a server, you just ship a bunch of JavaScript. And like you can keep that JavaScript on the client and just launch it locally. And it uses that HTTP API that I had in my first architecture slide to get all the content down and render it locally which is, if you think about it, like the same model as like a native app, like especially the kinds that I'm talking about with these clients where um, really all they are, if you reduce it fundamentally to its elemental piece, is like those native apps that we built are really just views over web content, in my opinion. Um, and so maybe we can have some of these projects doing the same thing. And they have some really um, great benefits. Um, so everything is rendered in JavaScript. I guess that's a benefit if you like JavaScript. Um, flexible view layer. So, um, right, I haven't been talking about my larger screens talk, but it's not this. So what I'm gonna talk about at my full screens presentation is like 
um, all the ways that you can do mobile web. So like M dot mobile site versus like responsive. Uh, those are pretty much the big ones, and responsive sort of a lot, um, a lot hotter today than mobile sites. But mobile sites actually have a leg up in some ways, especially performance and like being lightweight. But I'm going to talk about a couple um, techniques that you can use where you have the same app but just switches views. Kind of like it's this pattern called one controller, multiple views. I think um, if you're familiar with the way a universal app works for iOS, where it's like the same app runs on iPhone and iPad, and it does different things depending on how big the screen is, it's sort of like the same, one of the same ideas that I'm recommending we can do with client-side web apps. So if you're dynamically rendering the views on the client side, you know how big your screen is. You can, at runtime, choose to Render the big view with all the pieces, or the medium view with some of the pieces, or the small view with the bare essentials. And the runtime performance isn't as effective as it is by mobile web. So that's like a real boon for these client-side frameworks, uh, speedy and responsive. And then also offline support. So um, one of the things that has also um, become really great in browsers is local storage. So we have uh, a local storage API that's uh, in Chrome anyway, based on um, Index DB, and it's just really fast and fantastic. And there's this whole ecosystem in the Node world, if you're interested, of things that are built on this level DB library, which builds Index DB. And uh, there's this whole ecosystem of like really amazing database apps built on that, but I won't get into it. Uh, but needless to say, offline support is really primarily enabled by shipping all this JavaScript to the client so they can run it without a network connection. So that's... Uh, that's like a really good idea, those client-side frameworks. I don't think anybody would argue with me. And like, just to like sort of wrap up my talk, I'm gonna give you guys like a really bad idea that I think um, there's like a one percent chance that this will happen and become fantastic. Uh, it's sort of like crazy idea alert, which is uh, kill the DOM, kill HTML, kill HTML. It sucks for doing apps because really. It's designed to be a static document. The whole API of HTML, and when, when you render HTML, and like when, you, like when you write HTML, it's HTML, and when you render it and show it to somebody, it becomes something called the DOM, which is the document object model, which is really just like an operating representation of all those tags you wrote in HTML. Um, and the problems with the DOM that like plague all this web development fundamentally is that it's like really slow to render. Um, and as slow as it is to render, it's even slower to repaint. And by repaint, what I mean is, so let's say you load your web page, and you want to use JavaScript or some sort of user interaction to change something. As soon as you change anything that alters layout, let's, let's say you click a button and a little pane opens up. Everything related around that, and typically is the entire document, has to recalculate and repaint. It's this really, it's like, it's like a, just a model that's designed to be static, and anytime you try to make it move and do things, uh, it's extremely slow. And, and like, when I said JavaScript was something that could be improved, I think the DOM is something that can't fundamentally be improved because, because of its nature, because it's designed to be this one document where every tag flows into the next one. And the layout of this 39th thing on the page is dependent on the 12th thing, and that's dependent on the 11th thing, and so everything's interconnected. Um, it's kind of a problem for having that, those really snappy, responsive, um, fast-moving, UIs that we've come to expect from native apps. I, I feel like in some ways we can't really get away from some of that dog slowness, except, like I mentioned earlier, people are doing crazy good things with HTML5 Canvas. So even though Canvas is an HTML5 tag, it's like its own view layer. It's, it doesn't have anything to do with the document model. When you write, when you paint on Canvas, you can do fantastic things like like uh, you can run like 3D shoot 'em up games at 60 frames a second, and it's hardware accelerated. It has raster and vector drawing, including you know WebGL for 3D stuff, and a low-level JavaScript API that is uh, sane and like really efficient and fast. Um, and what I wanted to do is like just link out to a few of these things. I can't really take you to these sites right now, but I encourage you to follow up if you're interested in this bit of it at all. I would suggest 
checking out these projects um, that are all basically UI libraries built on top of Canvas, not using the DOM and HTML at all, but I believe the goals of these projects are to deliver a UI library as coherent and powerful and fast as um, like UIKit and Coco on iOS or um, the, the, all the UI libraries that you have on Android. Like, when you're, when you're doing a native app, and forgive me, I may not have the right terminology, like I believe you're, you're typically, if you're doing like the 101 app for Android, you're pulling from a library of buttons and uh, navigation components and view containers and transitions between them that are all done for you. And we don't really have something like that in HTML. We have a bunch of like links and buttons that we contort and distort to be what we want, but they're never ideal. And so I believe that these things can be as fast as slide is going to be up somewhere on the web, maybe on Twitter or on our blog after this. So if you're interested, check these things out. I think it's a fantastic opportunity. And if all those things that are sort of on the horizon go perfectly, we arrive at what I like to call the unrealistic utopia, <laughs> where the same architecture that I had at the beginning is sort of reformed and you have this mythical one client application that consumes your content management system and API that you can't really get away from. Those pieces are sort of fundamental. You build this one client that consumes it and with dynamically switching views can be deployed into all these app stores like we've got the Apple App Store, and then the OSX App Store, Windows 8, Blackberry World, Chrome and Firefox, and then these web app things that all fit in. But then we also have, you know, PS4 and Xbox and maybe the Kindle store and maybe like your internet enabled refrigerator. Like maybe maybe you want to read the Global Mail in your refrigerator. I'm not I'm not here to say that you shouldn't read the Global Mail on your refrigerator. But it would really be painful if I had to go to like General Electric's API and figure out like, oh, okay, how do they want to do apps now? I gotta like build another app that runs on the refrigerator. It's kind of getting ridiculous. So we sort of like, as much as um, I do believe in native apps, and like the reason I call this unrealistic utopia is because I don't actually think this is ever gonna happen, and nor should it, because there's good reasons why you want separate apps in all these places, like I said earlier you often want them to be fundamentally different. You want them to work differently and you want them to look differently. But as an advocate for the web and thinking about the web and where it's going, I absolutely think it should go in this direction. And um, hopefully if you're building web, you think of building your project in ways that fit this possible future. And uh, I hope that all the um, players like Google and Firefox and uh, Apple to some degree all sort of continue to invest in this technology. Thanks a lot. Derek, we're looking forward to seeing your screens presentation in just a couple of weeks.